So up next, we have uh, Dr. Zach Fogarty, who is a pediatrics and global health resident at Baylor College of Medicine. And we'll be speaking today on a novel calculation of pulse pressure variation can reliably predict fluid responsiveness in the NICU. All right, thank you. Uh, like I said, I'm Dr. Fowdy. Um, I have Texas Children's Baylor College of Medicine. Uh, I have a big team we work with. There are some of their names. Um, doctors, it does have a conflict, but there's no financial interest in this work and no other disclosures. And we do have some funding from the NIH that supported some of this work. Um, so today I wanna to talk to you kind of about four, four big things. The first is just, first of all, why do we care about fluid management um, in medicine? Um, and then some gaps in current practice. Uh, and then looking at new techniques for calculating pulse pressure variation. Uh, and then how does this apply and what future research can we do? Uh, so let's talk about some of the fluid management things first. So first of all, why do we care about fluid status? So as, as neonates transition from interim into extra life, there's a lot of changes that happen in their physiology as they uh, go from living in a bag of water to, um, to the environment that, that we're in here in Houston. Um, or elsewhere. So it's exaggerated in extreme preemies um, and then other extremely low birth weight infants. Um, and really the reason we care about it is uh, if we have excessive fluid intake, we have increased risk of bad outcomes. So chronic lung disease, necrotizing enterocolitis, uh, patent duct ductus arteriosus are some of the big ones, um, but really all cause mortality also goes up with, uh, with excessive fluid intake. So when we talk about fluid responsiveness, um, over here on the right is uh, the, the startling curve that looks at ventricular preload and stroke volume. So ventricular preload is how much is your heart filling and then stroke volume is really how much are you able to, uh, to pump out of your heart. So as you increase your preload, right, as you go from down here on the, um, to the bottom right, as you increase your preload, your stroke volume will also increase uh, and, uh, to a certain point. So when we say fluid responsive, we're saying we're taking someone who has low preload, giving them extra fluid, increasing the filling of their heart, and then hopefully getting a big bang for our buck in stroke volume. Patients who are not fluid responsive already have good preload. And so giving them extra fluid really doesn't give you any extra stroke volume. And actually this is a simplified version and you'll fall off the curve and start actually losing stroke volume if you have too much stretch. So the questions we wanna know are, if we give the neonate fluids, can we actually increase their stroke volume uh, and then increase their stroke volume or their cardiac output? In adults, this is studied extensively trying to figure out the best method of this. And one of the most uh, highly studied um, measures of this is called pulse pressure variation. So people who are down here around A have a high pulse pressure variation. And then people who are uh, have a low pulse pressure variation are up here on B. Um, so the thought is pulse pressure radiation uh, puts you lower on the start on the startling curve. Um, so that works great. So let's talk about some of the gaps in current practice. So in adults, this is the way we calculate. So this is an arterial line blood form, uh, arterial blood pressure waveform. Um, so this is time, and this is your um, arterial blood pressure. Um, so the top of these points is your systolic blood pressure when the heart is contracting. Um, and then the bottom is your diastolic blood pressure when the heart is filling. Um, so when you, the way you calculate pulse pressure variation, the pulse pressure is the difference between uh, your systolic blood pressure and your diastolic blood pressure. So when you're looking at the variation, you look at your max pulse pressure, which is represented by this line, and then your minimum blood pressure, which is this smaller line over here. The differences in these, as you notice, um, kind of each of these is a heartbeat. So beat to beat, you have differences in your cardiopulmonary interactions of what's the, the, the influence of your lungs um, and breathing on your, on your blood pressure and your uh, cardiac cycle. Um, so due to that, you have these variations uh, and you can calculate those differences to say, if you have a lot of influence, then you, you're fluid responsive. So some problems with this calculation for our kids in the NICU. Um, so for this to be reliable, you have to have consistent cardiopulmonary interactions. By that I mean, um, you really need to have large tidal volume. So each time you breathe, you need to take in about eight milliliters per kilogram. Um, in our NICU, uh, for really for neonates, um, that number's usually no more, it's usually around five, or four to six range. So we're using smaller tidal volumes than, than what they use in the, in the adult ICU. 
You also need a high heart rate to respiratory rate ratio uh, greater than 3.6. This is problematic because in neonates, neonates breathe a lot faster. Their heart rate's also higher, uh, because, but because their baseline heart rate is so high, we, we usually don't get up to that 3.6 ratio. And then finally, you have to be innovated, mechanically ventilated, and no spontaneous breaths so that you can really look at the interactions there. So rarely are these three things met in the NICU, which causes just a whole lot of noise in the signal uh, as we try to, try to analyze the pulse pressure variation. So now that we know the gaps, let's talk about kind of how we can overcome some of these things. So the question is, how can we look at this data differently? Right? How can we take this arterial line data, uh, this nice um, signal that we have, and decide um, what signal and, and what's the noise in there caused by some of the inconsistent cardiopulmonary respiration? So what we've done is that we do a we take that same arterial line data and do a fast Fourier uh, transform, a convolution-based approach. So basically. We're taking this and breaking it down into its frequencies, looking at <clears throat> over here in the blue is the respiratory component um, and the respiratory influence. Over here in the red is the cardiac component, this big, um, this big spike here. So do a convolution of your um, heart rate and respiratory rate um, and look in this purple area of what are the interactions between your heart rate and respiratory rate? How does that affect your overall um, arterial line? tracings. So really just kind of looking for those oscillations that are in uh, these areas uh, in the purple area there. So with this, um, this is a, a, a previous study that members of our group did. Um, so we were able to kind of um, use this calculation mm -hmm. and it's robust at a signal noise ratio. It's about six times smaller than traditional pulse pressure variation calculations. And that allows for improved signal recovery of pulse pressure variation in situations where cardiopulmonary interactions are not constant. So in the cases we talked about uh, in the NICU where we're not meeting those three criteria. So uh, it looks good and we can recover the signal, but does it actually work to predict fluid responsiveness? What we did, we did a retrospective analysis at, at Texas Children's in the NICU over about a little over two year period. And we looked at infants who got a packed red blood cell transfusion during admission while they had an arterial catheter uh, for invasive blood pressure monitoring. So the thought here is if we go back to the Starling curve, we give packed red blood cells and that increases the preload because we're giving more, uh, we're giving them more fluid. We excluded any patient who didn't have um, uh, sufficient data collection. So there's a lot of reasons why you have signal dropout um, in the arterial line. Um, so if we had a lot of signal dropout um, during that period, we excluded them. And also we excluded infants who were on vasoactive medications during the transfusion such as dopamine, epinephrine, norepinephrine, and vasopressin as those will uh, alter your startling curve and some of your other, the hemodynamics. So we, um, just looking for the cleanest data set we could use, excluded a lot of infants who were on those medications. We collected a lot of data, here are some of them, um, and then we used our Fourier transform <clears throat> to, uh, to calculate pulse pressure variation. So to determine who is fluid responsive, we looked at pulse pressure variation at baseline. Um, so for about a 15 minute period prior to transfusion and then um, in 30 minute periods after transfusion, um, kind of a, a moving 30 minute period. Um, and we did an average of the pulse pressure variation over about a one minute period um, and then an average over 30 minutes. The change in pulse pressure variation we ranked for each of those time epochs. Um, if it was less than 40th percentile, we considered them a non-responder. If they were greater than 60th percentile, we called them a responder. And if they were between 40th and 60th percentile for pulse pressure variation change, uh, we consider them inconclusive. For our training set, we looked at just the non-responders and responders um, to train our set. And then uh, we included the inconclusive and kind of looked at all of all comers um, when we, uh, when we did the validation. For a predictive analysis, we did bootstrapping with 100 random realizations of training and test sets, looked at a, a variety of different models, uh, and then we used ROC AUC for each of the um, 30 to 60, 60 to 90, and 90 to 120 minutes after the start of transfusion to see uh, just the differences in, the, in each of those time periods. So the results, um, so here's kind of the best set we did. So um, going back to the models here, um, logistic regression performed the best and the best time period was 30 to 60 minutes after the start of transfusion. Um, so 
this is the, the Rock AC plot for, um, for that. So the red line is our test curve uh, and the blue line is our training curve. Um, so as you see, we had a Rock AC uh, for our test at a 0.89, uh, which we were I'm pretty pleased with. Uh, and it, well, it's well approximated to our training curve, which uh, indicates that the model does not suffer from, from overfitting. So a fairly re reliable measure here to predict fluid responsiveness. So how do we compare to some of the other measures? It's been studied pretty um, extensively um, in, the, in the pediatric population, but hasn't really been taken up much just because of some of the issues we talked about with pulse pressure variation. Um, so I've highlighted a couple of studies. There was a GAN in 2013 did a systematic review of fluid responsiveness and looked at a whole lot of people who have tried to figure this out before. Um, so over here on the left is something called stroke volume index that uses echocardiography, uh, esophageal. Um, so basically it's in a, uh, uh, transesophageal Doppler down the th down the throat, look at the heart from inside the esophagus, um, and they were able to have a, a rock AC of about 0.9 through a very invasive measure. Um, uh, so we kind of perform similarly to these invasive measures. Over here on the right, there are a lot of echocardiography. These are either done through transthoracic, so a, an echocardiogram through the chest, or with the probe down the throat into the esophagus. Um, and what we see here is the rock AUCs for, uh, for these studies that are very invasive and require a, a experienced operator with echocardiography um, have similar, you know, a range from about 0.85 to, to one um, with various measures that we're looking at. The other arterial pressures that we looked at, um, uh, so other people have done pulse pressure variation before with traditional calculations. And as you see, the rock AUCs are usually between about 0.5 to 0.7, um, so not reliable. Renner was able to get some, that were similar to ours, but those are in very controlled environments in the cardiac OR um, after coming off bypass for ASD or VSD closure. Um, uh, and so those patients are not moving, very controlled environment, like not like the NICU. So ours, um, we're able to kind of recover and perform as well in our uh, non-controlled environment as they were in the controlled environment. Um, so, so how does this, now that we have this information, how can we kind of use this in the future? So first thing is fluids are not benign. Like we talked, like I talked about earlier, there are bad outcomes for kids who get too much fluid. So the question is, if we use this in a prospective manner, can we actually improve outcomes? You know, reduce rates of BPD, NAC, PDA, all cause mortality in the NICU. And then also looking outside of the NICU, can we use this in the pediatric ICU or the pediatric emergency department to manage fluids better? Um, maybe avoid admissions to the ICU, improve management once we're in the ICU, and then decrease length of stay and outcomes in the PICU. Uh, and then the, the next question is, this is invasive. It requires an arterial catheter to be in the, usually the radial artery, um, and there are risks associated with that. So um, looking at what's the, the value of this um, and how do, we, uh, how do we improve outcomes? So um, are there other non-invasive ways to, to measure this? To get the same data and run the same analysis and use this transform to uh, can we can we get the arterial data in a different way and then secondly um, if we can't can we actually um, is is the benefit of being able to improve outcomes does that outweigh the risk of having arterial catheters in more kids and should we be putting these catheters in additional kids for this mock uh, so that is what i have thank you thank you that was really interesting I was wondering if you could talk just a little bit more about what specific the actionability is um, with this, if you had this data. I mean, do you have options other than giving fluids? Yeah. So the question is, you know, we have parameters for when we give fluids. So um, usually it's based off symptomatic anemia. So, um, But there may be a certain subset of kids who have lower blood pressures who could benefit from extra fluid. Um, so we could give them a blood transfusion. We could increase... Um, for we can increase how much feeds they're giving, uh, they're getting, um, or things like uh, TPN of giving extra fluids in that. The other right. is we have kids who who won't we don't is to predict which kids may need Lasix or diuretics after blood transfusions. So they're anemic, but they're not fluid. They're not fluid responsive. Mm -hmm. And so if we give them a blood transfusion, should that then be followed by Lasix to help them pee out all the extra fluid so right. that we don't fluid overload them? Gotcha. Makes sense. Really interesting. Um, all right. If there's no other questions, I think it's uh, time for the poster session.
We would appreciate everyone uh, heading over to the poster session and voting on uh, several different categories, um, including the best poster, the best use of visualization, the best use of public data, and the biggest potential impact. So thanks, everyone, and I'll see you over there.